but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough Hello everybody, welcome back to the Body Serve. I am Jonathan. And I'm James. This is episode 3 of 2022 season 8, or third episode in what a week? I'm already tired of 2022. Like I'm I'm I need a break from the Body Serve. <laughs> <laughs> so much has been going on, so so much. When we left you last, the episode was a full no lay episode. Where did we leave off? We left off the, uh, oh, there was about to be that first hearing, which ended up being about the procedure involved in canceling Novak's visa the first time. Judge Kelly uh, granted the appeal, saying that the immigration officers didn't give Novak the time that they promised him to gather some extra documents. I, like, they could have waited the, the further 45 minutes and we wouldn't be in this mess, right? Who knows what other procedural... Right. What other issues may have come exactly. up in the hearing. The Novak's lawyers are very prepared and will dump reams of documents on these judges to get another appeal, stretch out these hearings. It's become clear that there will be no go quietly in the middle of the night for Djokovic. Oh, we are well, well beyond that. The Australian Open starts in two days. And we're still at a point where... There's no end in sight for these litigations. Before we get into to where we are, because we're recording right after another hearing just happened, uh, what are some of the things that happened since we last recorded? Oh, wow. You mean uh, in this saga or... No, in this saga. Well, after that hearing, we were waiting around because the government lawyer kind of uh, tipped the government's hat and said the immigration minister may or will probably cancel his visa again well he so just said be ready he told judge kelly explicitly <laughs> right. hey girl just so mm -hmm. you know right at the end of that hearing he was like just so you know we're gonna be doing this right so the tennis community was waiting on pins and needles pretty much the entire work week for minister alex hawk to make an announcement whether or not he was going to cancel it it was so bad it got so bad that tennis twitter watched the Australian Prime Minister give a briefing on a full cabinet meeting mm -hmm. during which he did not mention this issue because it was with the immigration minister. It was not the prime minister's purview at that time. There were like four straight nights where we're in different time zones. We're just all scrolling through Twitter waiting for the updates from Miss Karen Sweeney, from Mr. <laughs> Paul Sakal. Or Mr. Ben Rothenberg, one of the three, to give us, tell us what's going on. And it didn't come. And then, cue the music. Hawk strikes upon the hour as the sun begins to fade. Took him a long time to figure out how to chase no lay away. Wow. <laughs> you know, I, I want everybody to know that I made that up. I just refused to sing it. You made that up, and you have the physical gifts to make it work, but you refuse. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to be singing on this podcast. You refuse to let. And I recommend you take the same advice Listen, going forward. if you're editing this part of the episode, you best leave that in, because <laughs> this is a good quality mic. Mm -hmm. It's the best I'm ever going to sell. Do we have auto-tune on this? <laughs> I mean, it just came out of nowhere. I, was so... I went to bed and I was like, well, clearly Mr. Hawk is not saying anything tonight. So I'm going to bed. I guess we'll see Novak on uh, on Monday when he plays his first round match. Friday, Friday night, Friday night, our time, Friday evening. I don't know when it was. It was on a Friday. It was Friday in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. It's Friday mm -hmm. now. It's Friday night now where we are. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Move it along. <laughs> and immediately... Immediate mo, we had the uh, notifications of intentions to challenge, further court appearances. Within an hour of that announcement, we were back in court. I was watching another 
appearance with Mr. Kelly, Judge Kelly. Last night, yes. And so that was to announce that the matter would be transferred to the federal court. Minister Hawk, Mr. Hawk, I don't know how they identify their Alex Hawk. MPs. Just in, Alex okay, Hawk. Okay, Alex Hawk. This time, he canceled the visa under the same provision of the Migration Act, but citing the, quote, health and good order grounds. So this was what we mentioned in our previous episode about the person being a potential risk to the health and good order of Australia. He said it was in the public interest to cancel this visa. He's mentioned things like the potential of Djokovic spreading anti-vax sentiment across Australia. This is separate and apart from the actual, you know, risk of infecting people, which we know, if he did recently have COVID, is probably quite low. Mm. This is more of a a sentiment. Uh, So when this happened, folks, including myself, were like, well, what's next? What's going to happen? And then kudos and thanks and a hat tip to Sangeeta Pillai. She is an Australian legal researcher and scholar. She gave us everything we needed to know in an expansive thread that if you are on Twitter following this stuff, you will have seen it by now because Mm -hmm. it was to the point. She explained the the section that Alex Hawk cited to cancel the visa. She explained what's next in the process, which was first this procedural hearing today, which outlined the transfer to federal court. There's a hearing again tomorrow. And Ms. Palai explained that even if the cancellation is overturned today, the minister can cancel it again. Because there's there are, another section. Right. There are more sections of this law, and the minister kind of gets another go at it. Another innings, so to, just oh, for wow. you Australians out there, you know? <laughs> if DRS gives him a second life... I, I don't know what that means, the, for the record. The decision review system. Oh, like the Hawkeye of cricket. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, tomorrow, this will be uh, Sunday in Australia will be another hearing. We are not sure yet if it will be the single judge or a bench of three judges. The appellant, I guess, does have the option, and his lawyers have requested it. The government doesn't want a bench, but Djokovic's lawyers said, well, we're going to appeal the decision anyway, and then we'll be entitled to a bench of three judges anyway. So let's just skip that step. Sunday, there could be a decision, and that brings us to one day before the start of the Australian Open. So Djokovic and his colleagues will not have any idea what's going on on Monday until the day before. Folks who need to be readjusted in the draw, should Novak be vacated from the draw, they won't know what's happening until the very last minute. Right. At this point, I really do not care if he plays in this tournament, if he goes home. Like, this needs to end. It's Like, it's not even... The memes aren't even making me laugh anymore. It's just too much. No, he needs to go home. It is... (laughs) I mean, it's... What? Absolutely shameless at this point. Absolutely. No, I'm saying that I'm refusing to inject any more of my emotional energy on this. Okay. So whatever... Say say that. Whatever happens, happens, right? Mm -hmm. But we can say that at this point, it is so obvious to everybody but Djokovic and some loyal supporters that... It would probably be best for him, certainly would be best for all of us, but it would probably also be best for him if he just left and showed some grace. But I fear that the time for grace is long past. Secure a non-ban for three years, do some negotiating, Uh, yeah, and let us all carry on. Before we got to these latest court hearings, (sighs) (laughs) he continued to play in our face. Because he released this statement on the internet, this long, long statement explaining his whereabouts after he allegedly tested positive. Because there were a lot of holes that needed to be filled in his story. Yes. the His mother went on breakfast television in Australia and said, well, yeah, uh, he, he tested po- and immediately went into isolation. And then here comes Novak, what, not 24 hours later, with an entire contradiction of that. Mm -hmm. Maury said, and the lie detector test revealed that was a lie. (laughs) It was a case of which lie shall we allow to have life? Right. Which lie is the least damaging? 
we spoke last time about the revelation of when this PCR test was taken, when the results were supposed to have been returned, and the events that he attended afterward. And it was a zero-sum game for him, right? It was either to admit he was incredibly reckless after testing positive or admit that he lied about the test, which would obviously never happen. That was his ticket into the country, he thought. In the notes app, he said he didn't receive his results before attending those events on the 17th, but he was made aware that he was positive and then chose to go to the photo shoot and interview with the L'Equipe journalists. He, I mean, it's just absolutely wild. And so you're wondering, folks can come to their own conclusions, but you do wonder why he admitted to that. To what end? Something needed to be admitted to. Yeah. Because the the holes were everywhere. They, they need to the be... holes remain. Yes. Uh, but he admitted to something that was incredibly reckless and immoral. To to attend this photo shoot knowing that you're positive, to not notify anyone there because you didn't want to let the journalist down? Uh, really. An athlete. Professional athletes. Doesn't want to let journalists down. Yeah. They let journalists down all the time. Mm-hmm. It's part of the job. Um, well, it was... A- it was clear to us that he settled on that as the the least of the evils, right? Do I yeah. cop to exposing a bunch of children? No, that one's pretty bad. Do I cop to lying about the whole thing? That one will really blow up this whole situation. Mm. Do I just say, well, I was masked for the whole time at this thing with Lakeep, except for when my mask was off and I was screaming as part of the photo shoot, that part? Yeah, let's go with that one. Mm-hmm. And say nothing of the falsification of his travel record, which he attributes to Jen Shah's assistant number five. <laughs> <laughs> now, it is common to have members of your team or your manager to complete these travel documents. The problem is that there was uh, a falsehood. There was It was either a lie or an oversight on the travel document. When asked if he had traveled to a different country in the 14 days before arriving in Australia, he said no. And so when you reach the border, the border guard obviously doesn't give a shit if you filled it out or someone filled it out for you. You are representing yourself. And uh, again, if you weren't a famous athlete, they probably wouldn't uh, give you an oopsie. You know You know that thing when you're traveling in airports and they say, do not leave your bags unattended. The implication being somebody could put some drugs in your bag and then you are left holding the bag when that blows up. Like, this is the same concept. Yes. Fill out your travel document yourself or uh, accept the consequences, basically. Your point here at a base level is that this alone would be grounds for expulsion for 99.976% of the world population. Probably, yeah. But instead, we have somebody who has the resources to just throw money and a bevy of lawyers, not just lawyers, but partners, multiple partners, at this situation to try and maintain his stake in something that he believes he's owed, Mm -hmm. that he's entitled to. Vorakova is not in Australia because she did not have the resources to throw money at this. Instead, she was made to take her clothes off during her deportation process. Yeah, so she has uh, explained a pretty humiliating ordeal that she went through with the Australian Border Force. The PTBA claims that they have been in constant contact with her. Uh, So we, I guess, will see. I imagine at this point, she has a good case, like a civil case against Tennis Australia, at least, to get her expenses back. The great irony here, well, one of the great ironies is that Novak and the PTPA claim to be fighting for claim to be fighting against the great embedded inequities in tennis when this instance highlights just how much he himself is... Is positioned to take advantage of his extreme power compared to other tennis players. And has no qualms about exercising all of it and then some, even when, as far as we're concerned, he's deeply in the wrong. And as far as the majority of Australia is concerned... He's deeply in the wrong. And the majority of the people watching around the world share the same sentiment. 
while this drama has been unfolding, there has actually been a lot of tennis. In a normal year, we would have been talking about all the lead-up tournaments, and we will, but Australia put together a pretty big roster of lead-up tournaments this year, despite the, you know, the challenges related with the Omicron surge. The first week of tournaments saw a literal handful of exciting winners. We had five, Simona Halep, Rafa Nadal, Gal Mofis, Ash Barty, and Amanda Anisimova. And Canada won the ATP Cup. Uh, now it, I reserve yes, it happened. I reserve the right to retroactively say, "Wow, this tournament is so important. I absolutely love it." I am being facetious. I do not care about this tournament, but I can still be excited that Canada won. I I could not care one way or the other. Honestly, <laughs> good for those men. Dennis and Felix seem to have a great time, and that Braden fella as the third wheel. You know, good, good for them. Felix was able to get some bonus slash bogus points to get a career high ranking of number nine. Felix got some solid wins. Another win over Zverev. He beat uh, Bautista Agut in the final. Dennis beat PCB. Didn't have to play a doubles rubber because they won the two singles matches first. Yeah, enough of ATP Cup. Okay. Back to the important stuff. <laughs> Rafael Nadal is a titleist for the 89th time for the 19th season in a row, which is crazy to think about. He won a Melbourne Somerset 1, beating Maxime Cressy 7-6-6-3 in the final. It's also his ninth straight final that he's won. And I think this dates back to probably Djokovic beating him at the 2019 Australian Open. I believe so, yes. Now, Maxime Cressy had a pretty good year last year, and he shows up in Australia as one of the more unheralded Americans, I would say. There are a lot of them in the top 100. It's just that none of them to date gives the impression of a world beater. And so he has this cute result, making the final. And the the thing that stands out to me is that there is so much Maxime Cressy thirst right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was more than a cute result. To Like, let's give the guy credit. He qualified for this tournament, and then he won three more matches. Sorry, four more matches. I mean, cute result can encompass that. Okay. But he beat Opelka. I didn't, Opelka. I didn't mean beat... it in a derogatory oh, way. Oh, He beat Dimitrov, and then, you know, stacked up well against Rafa in the final. After this match, Rafa told Spanish press that he had doubts that he'd ever compete again after what he went through over the last six months. And so for him to come back to tennis so quickly after testing positive for COVID in December and to win right away, albeit not against the strongest competition, he also had a walkover mixed in there as well. This is as good a preparation for the Australian Open as he could have hoped for. Down in Adelaide, another old man, Gal Mofis, oh my God, <laughs> won uh, a title, reaching a final for the 18th season in a row, which is close to the record. He's still, you know, he's trailing Nadal every year. He would have been tied with Nadal, except very shortly thereafter, Nadal made his own final to make it 19 in a row. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately for Gael, he went on to play the following week and seemed to have picked up an injury of sorts. I don't know how serious it is at this moment, but uh, assuming that he's healthy once the Australian Open starts, this is great preparation for his season. Also in Adelaide, Ash Barty, world number one, unassuming world number one, showed up again and just dropped the hammer over and over and over and over again. It was a flawless victory, a series of flawless victories, ruthless, precise. It was it was a statement to start the year. Yeah, the, the women's draw in Adelaide was phenomenal. It was top-notch. Ash played uh, Coco Golf early on, won in three sets. Sonia Kennan is back. She won two matches. She did. Then Ash threw down a career best 17 aces against Kennan. I believe she lost one point on serve in the match. Hmm. And then the match that a lot of folks were waiting for that first week, 
Ash versus Iga Shiontek, who was a titleist in Australia the previous year in one of the lead-up tournaments, and Ash beat her four and two. Yeah, it was um, it was a stellar week for Ash Barty. Mm-hmm. Rybakina has been looking great last week and this week. She reached the final, played Ash. Uh, it was definitely a lot easier than I expected. Ash winning six three six two, but then she comes to Sydney this week and really just blasts Emma Raducanu off the court. I don't know if Emma has played somebody who hits the ball like Rybakina. I believe it was the highest ranked player that she'd ever played mm-hmm. up until this point in her career. That's upsetting to me. It is something because you will... she won a, a Grand Slam yeah. tournament. I mean, it's something that you've had ample time to make your peace with. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, I don't think this is anything to be alarmed about, but both U.S. Open finalists didn't have a great week. Sriantec pretty much hammered Fernandez in Adelaide as well. It seems to me that it's a natural response on the part of all these other women on tour, a lot of them more accomplished and just slightly older than Miss Fernandez and Miss Raducanu, that they would have seen what happened in Flushing Meadows and will want to bring a certain extraness to their performances oh, against yeah. them this year. Yeah. I think from from some corners, Raducanu will have a target on her back just because of what she did, winning the US Open with so little experience. I'm sure some players are annoyed, perhaps jealous, but... Lots of projections here we're making onto other people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just saying what I would be. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> you'd be that and then some. But we know uh, these feelings are not always rational and they are competitors. People are going to be gunning for Radikano because of who she is and what she accomplished at such a young age. Mm-hmm. And she has very little experience on the WTA tour. So that's part of it. It's just getting used to playing matches every day. Week in, week out. Opponents are going to start figuring out her game, of course, because she was an unknown commodity it'll at be, Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. It'll be a gift to her if she could play matches every day. Yeah. The problem is mm-hmm. you show up and you lose and then you wait again. You have to stew in those feelings and those insecurities to try and right that ship one, two, three weeks down the line, maybe mm-hmm. on a different surface. It can get away from you really quickly. And so this year if there isn't a run that's made very quickly, could get away from her in a way that's going to create, I can already see it, create an even bigger just tornado of mess for her to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she has a ton of ranking points to gain this year. Every match she wins is, is a bonus. So her ranking will benefit a lot if she wins matches. But... I hope that she's able to keep in mind that she has a team around her that can just say, hey, you're still only, what, you're 18 years old. You have a long career ahead of you. This season will not define your career. So if it goes well, great. And if it doesn't, uh, this is the journey of a tennis player. We're, I suspect we're going to have to be talking about this a lot yes. this year. So let's we'll leave it there. Let's leave it there. Amanda Anisimova in the Melbourne Somerset 2. She defeated Sasnovich in the final. And Amanda is somebody who reached the semifinals of a slam at a very young age. A lot was expected of her, and she's really just been through it over the past few years. Her dad passed away. Her tennis took a long time to get back to where it should be. Her dad was such a central part of her, her tennis life. It's her first title since 2019 and her second overall. That was Melbourne Somerset 2. In Melbourne Somerset 1, Simona Halep, after James said that she was done. I don't know if he said that <laughs> on air. I, I don't am, think, I, am I giving that away? I think that was off the record. <laughs> Do we not have ethics? <laughs> that was in a chat somewhere. And you were like, yeah, I think, I think you know, she's getting married, the injuries. I felt like stuff. she was kind of going to wrap it up soon. And I, but I, I guess I was wrong. No, Well, I told you explicitly at the time that this is one of the biggest pieces of shit <laughs> I've heard in a long time. Fine, fine. I mean, she's married to a quadruple billionaire in the offseason. She's parted ways with, I, I said that like a Scottish person, parted, or a pirate. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. You mean she parted ways? Parted. She parted ways with Darren Cahill, who is working with Amanda Nisimova right now on a like a trial yes. basis. I mean, his colleagues routinely call him the best coach in professional tennis. But mm-hmm. well, back to Halep, she had all these big changes in the offseason coming off a year beset with injury. This is a statement win to tell folks, let folks know that you are still the one or one of the ones. You're still in the conversation. (laughs) Naomi Osaka is back in competition. She got three cute match wins and then dipped. People were really in their feelings about that, Mm -hmm. about her withdrawing. Because she, you know, she's done it before, majors before. And uh, you always have to, like, fake sight an injury. It's just how the sport works. It may be, there may be an injury because players are like always injured in some way. Mm-hmm. Or it could just be like, well, I got my wins. I'm going to go play the more important tournament. And I would understand why the WTA doesn't like that stuff. But I personally don't care. Hmm. It's, a, it's a polarizing topic. That's mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. I am not particularly invested at this moment. I reserve the right to change my mind at a future okay. date. Okay, fair enough. Week two of these pre-Australian Open tournaments, the current week, last night, which was the day, which was Friday during the day in Australia, tennis gave us what people have been deserving, what they've been waiting for. It was lit. Right? They got three sets of golf versus keys. They got Contivate bageling Krejcikova in the first set and then going on to lose in three sets. Andy Murray lobbing over Riley Opelka's head. (laughs) <laughs> beating him in three sets and not only that they got a dan evans bathroom break tantrum eh. but dan wasn't the one going to the bathroom to be clear he was quetching about a supposedly extended bathroom break of his opponent which i guess was only five minutes well they're doing this thing now based off of all the bathroom gates that happened last year that it's what a uh you get one break per match where it's either you go to the bathroom or you go change your clothes or you do it both at the same time. But you leave the court one time. I'm sure this will all go perfectly well and there will be no controversy about this, right? We're agreed. It's, I mean, people are always salty and in their feelings. <laughs> so this, <laughs> yes. is, this is not going to go away at all. That stuff happened in Sydney against Aslan Karatsev, who's reached the final against Andy Murray. This is Andy Murray's first final since October 2019. He was moving pretty well on that metal hip. Uh, I mean, just the wizardry, watching him drop a lob over that giant's head, is it's so disrespectful. But it's so exciting to watch. Three years ago to the day of Andy announcing that this could be his final match at the Australian Open. Wow, that was 2019? That was 2019. Three years to the day he makes his 69th career ATP final. He told us at the start of the season that one of, he has two goals. One is he currently has 46 ATP titles. He'd like to hit 50. It's a nice round number. It's a number that I've been hoping and wishing for Venus Williams for quite some time. Yeah. And he would like to make another deep run at a slam. As for Karatsev, listen, this is where he came to the fore last year at the ATP Cup that made his deep Mm -hmm. run at the Australian Open. And here here he is back in a final in Australia. This is something that he needed, to be frank. Mm -hmm. On the women's side in Sydney, Krejcikova is going to move on to the final against Bedosa, who beat Kazatkina. We've seen on the women's side a lot of folks who played well last year continuing to play well this year. Badosa, who made the year in finals in Guadalajara last year, she's back in a final. Krejcikova, we know she was in the conversation for player of the year last year. Was it a fluke? Would she be able to continue playing well in singles? She ate a pretty disgusting bagel in that first (laughs) set. (laughs) Yeah, it was pretty ugly. Until it wasn't. Against Contivate. And then she came back and won in three sets. Like, this is an indication that Barbara Krejcikova is not going anywhere. Down in Adelaide number two, uh, a pleasant surprise. 
if you're a fan of Madison Keys. She's had some great wins this week. Beats Fidelina in her opening match, Samsonova, and then beating Coco Goff in three sets. And another American who has not been performing particularly well, Allison Risk, will be her opponent in the final. Except she was resurgent at the end of last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. I believe she even won a title at the end of last year. Uh, so, again, carrying over form from at least the last part of 2022, still playing well again this year. Madison Keys, that first set, she did not look great. It was the same story <laughs> yeah, where yeah. the misfiring, the unable to get into a rhythm. And then she something clicked in the second set. She just started not missing. When Madison Keys is hitting and firing on all cylinders and not missing 10 feet beyond the baseline, she is a spectacle to watch. One yeah. of the most impressive things to watch in tennis. Mm-hmm. And there was Coco Goff at the end of that third set after... She had clawed her way back from being down a break, trying to hold on to send this thing to a tie break in the third set. And Madison Keys just would not stop rifling bullet returns at her. And one final one was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was quite the performance from Madison Keys after that first set Mm. last night. Speaking of resurgent, Thanasi Kokonakis, a year after his rebirth as a tennis player in Australia... He is in the final in Adelaide. He reached the semifinal the previous week. This is actually his first ATP final. He's been out here for a long time, was kind of a a teen prodigy, and, you know, he suffered many years of terrible injuries. Had this this huge moment last year, reaching the second round and taking Tsitsipas to five sets at the Australian Open. Uh, These are a, a series of great performances again. He's still only 24. (laughs) right it feels like he's been around for a very very long time Mm -hmm. and he has but he's still got time if his body cooperates and the talent clearly he's playing rinder knetch today uh for the title in adelaide number two kokonakis beats chilich who you know marin is just out here won titles last year still winning matches he's on the come up back to being seeded at a slam i believe he's a 28th seed Kokonakis is in a pretty tough part of the draw, and we'll talk about this mm. after, but it is what you expect for someone who comes in unseated. We'll see what he does in the Australian Open, but the momentum is uh, as good as he could have asked for. Sure, and a lot of these players have played multiple weeks in a row now, heading into the Australian mm. Open, and ideally, I guess you'd like that deep run to come the first week, and then maybe win a couple good matches, and then give a good account, lose in the quarterfinals <laughs> the week before the Australian <laughs> Open. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be challenging now for somebody like Mari, for somebody like Kokinakis, heading into the Australian Open. Very good weeks this week, but it right. may complicate things. But to be fair, Kokinakis was playing a lot last year. He won a challenger. He was just playing on the lower level of the tour, mostly. So it's not like he is out of practice, but someone like Andy Murray may suffer from playing too many matches. We I will see, of course. Mm. A few et-ceteras that we've noticed from the first couple weeks of competition. One of the more alarming ones is Arena Sabalenka having developed the serving yips. I didn't watch her first match where the yips debuted in just spectacular fashion this season. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's been struggling for a little bit with the serve, but this was something else. I And I didn't watch it, but I saw people describing it on Twitter. And I was like, well, this can't be that bad. Can it? They must yeah. be exaggerating. And I went and found highlights, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, uh, mm-hmm. this is not good. She actually told the umpire at one point that it was a technical issue, because she was breaking down crying in the match. The umpire asked her if she was all right, and she said, no, there's a technical problem. In uh, that match, she served 20-plus double faults, and still went, what, 6-4 in the third in that match. Mm-hmm. And she used the underhanded serve multiple times. This is like a superpower player, right? Mm -hmm. But she didn't use it as a strategy. No. She used it out of desperation. Like to get a serve. Literally nothing else was working. She she was hitting serves that landed beyond the baseline. Bernard Tomic, back in Australia, has a, a pretty significant fit that was caught on camera during his qualifying match in Melbourne. And he said... 
I can't believe you guys don't do PCR testing. You just do rapid tests for players. And I'm pretty sure I have COVID. I uh, bet you excuse- I bet you dinner, he says to the mm-hmm. umpire, I bet you dinner that in the next three days, I'm going to test positive. And if I do, you owe me dinner. Mm-hmm. And you know that Craig Tiley is sitting in a room alone screaming. Like he needs one more thing. This is the least of his problems. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Bernard is right in a sense that yes, PCR testing would be optimal in that situation. However, if you feel like you have COVID, you should not be playing. Yes. The same thing that. that we we criticized Djokovic for. It's not that Bernard tested positive, but he admitted in front of the world on camera that he had symptoms. Why are you here? And lo and behold, he won that bet because he did go on to test positive within three days. Yeah. So that is not a great sign. I hope, hope, hope that there is not an outbreak at the Australian Open, but they let this guy take the court. Mm -hmm. Sick. Right. But there's also an ethical issue of when the majority of the Victorian society, when the majority of Australia... Mm -hmm. Like Charles Dickens? When the majority of Australians don't have access to PCR testing, when it's in such short supply, despite the high demand, how is it a good look that the Australian Open should be dishing them out willy-nilly? Yeah, but that's been the story of the pandemic at all of the majors. Regular folks didn't have access to testing. They, you know, they restarted tennis in, uh, what, summer of 2020? Right, but Australia was never in this predicament Mm -hmm. with the number of cases right. and testing. But other countries that were hosting Grand Slam tournaments were in dire straits yes. when they were hosting. Yes. So Wimbledon in mm-hmm. England, for example. Uh, you know, the- I'm just saying it's not. I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, the Australian Open is garbage no, for that. But, you know, if you are, you've decided to host this tournament, you do need to do the minimum and do PCR testing for these players. The rap- we know the issues with the rapid tests. We've all seen the graphs and the studies and everything. It's beyond the time where this needs to be explained to the people in charge. I'm saying, there. what do you do when there aren't any? Uh, you you don't host a massive super spreader event, I, I suppose. I guess that's the other option. That is an option that we are so clearly far beyond. <laughs> yes. With world sport. Mm-hmm. So I think it calls for... Maybe a little bit more understood. I don't know. Like, there's no <laughs> correct answer to this yeah. thing. Uh, a few very unforced errors from our faves this week. Rafa practiced with Alexander Zverev, so that was great. Thanks for that. Venus, uh, another supporter of Alexander Zverev, in comments at least. She is a big Instagram commenter. She likes to comment on a lot of ATP white men's She sure profiles. does. And, you know, I'm beginning to think maybe she does have the bandwidth. Hmm. I, I mean, that was her line, right? Yeah. Good luck to those men. Uh, she may need to revise. Are you saying we need to do a rebranding? Uh, no, because it a, it's a great line, of course. But she has the bandwidth to get involved with the Djokovic thing and say, win it all. What? I've always gotten the impression that when Venus says I don't have the bandwidth, like she really just does not pay attention to anything in tennis. So I think it is plausible that she doesn't understand what what's going on. I think it's plausible. But at this point, this <laughs> no, type of stuff I, is happening way too much. I don't think it's a good idea to infantilize a fave in that way. I agree. I absolutely mm-hmm. agree. I'm just saying this is what I've seen and come to know from her over mm-hmm. the years. Mm-hmm. But I'm also saying that these things are adding up way too many times. Sure, sure. The Rafa thing was complete shit. Like after scoring so many brownie points throughout the entire pandemic, going a long way to put the male model comments in the (laughs) rear view. I mean, it was never going to go away because those were still shite as well. Yeah, Yeah, right. But he had built up a lot of goodwill based on how he's moved through the world during the pandemic and the way he's spoken about things. We have not been ones on this show to be trying to make a comparison between Nadal and Djokovic. We don't feel like we need to make that comparison when it comes to how they've handled the the pandemic. Maybe we have at some point last year. I bet we probably have, but we're not harping on that. 
We could have. We didn't even mention Rafa's name once on the last episode. No. Not even once. No. no. Right. But the fact is, he has handled this well. And now to see this, it's just, it's super disappointing. And I'll tell you this, if Nadal somehow makes it through his really tough draw and becomes the first top 10 player that that guy beats at a Grand Slam, it'll be what he deserves. Oh. That's all I'm going to say about that. it's certainly not what we deserve, so I hope not. Earlier this week, you may have seen that Stuart Fraser, the Scottish reporter, made a a blunder, right? He'd made an error and asked Rafa a question about reaching the final back in 09 and winning it and then never having reached the final again, which obviously we know is not true. He's done it multiple times. Rafa's face was priceless. He was like, huh? Uh, Stuart Fraser had the good grace to go on Twitter and say, wow, so like, sorry, this was just a mistake. It's been a long week. Sorry, everybody. It, It was an error. Rafa right. took it in stride, exactly. too. Like, these things happen. He admitted his his mistake publicly. He owned it. And we can all move on. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, this is a big setup. Who it's are we dunking setup. on here? Who are we dunking on? Well, we're dunking on Riley Opelka, who decided to dunk on Stuart Fraser and say, wow, like, this is the media we have to deal with. These idiots. Mm-hmm. Riley's doing what he accuses tennis Twitter of doing all the time. Right? It's shaming people. It's embarrassing people for no reason. This is what he's doing. What was the point of that? To say that the tennis media sucks because one person made a mistake that he admitted to and corrected? No, I don't know this journalist. I've never met him, but I know he's been around the game a long time. And it's just so inconsequential. Yeah. I think my point is, based on how Rafa received it and how Stu gave an explanation afterward, all parties involved are fine with it. <laughs> there are no aggrieved parties here. Sometimes mistakes do happen. But to take that and then make it a blanket extrapolation about the worthiness of all journalists to occupy this space. It was just, you know, you are doing way too much. And for a while now, you have given the impression of somebody who thinks that they're smarter than they really are. And this really paints you squarely in that light. Yeah, this is sort of part of his ongoing anti-media campaign. And I promise you, if if you want to be like the artistic, open-minded tennis player, this is not the move, dude. No. It's it's giving your big white friends in American tennis is what it's giving. It's giving not only some of the fellow trees, but also his uncle. When he first came on the scene and everybody's like, can we trust Riley? Can we trust Riley? The problem was the the uncle going off on, on Twitter. Like, he just mm. didn't really know. And then we're like, well, well, wow. This is this is actually hopeful here. And he could have had it all. <laughs> he could have had it all. He could have <laughs> occupied a vacuum in U.S. men's tennis that people have been craving for. Not us. Who's been but craving? people have been craving for. A white American player that they can stand. Hmm. It's not been something that we've been particularly concerned with, but, you know, he had that on lock. And then it's just not being able to get out of one's own way. Hmm. Jonathan, I'll remind you that you cannot cancel American men's tennis, <laughs> although you may try. I'm just saying I've had enough. Hmm. I, I, There was a long tether. There was a, a lot of leeway put up with a lot of shit on Twitter, and I had to unfollow this week. Okay. Draw time. We're going to do this so quickly, so swiftly, so efficiently. But first, okay. But first, we're going to tell you who we think our breakout players are going to be for the 2022 season. It's three players from the WTA, three players from the ATP, broken down into sections coming from players ranked, well, zero to 50. (laughs) Players ranked one to 50. 51 to 100, and then above 100. Mm -hmm. So on the ATP Tour, James, who are your picks for breakout Mm -hmm. players? As usual, I will not be explaining or justifying my picks. Taylor Swift okay, for top 50. I think he's... Oh, no, I'm not explaining. Never mind. Uh, (laughs) For the 51 to 100, the... Now, the easy pick is Cressy, but my other pick is uh, Davidovich Fokina. Okay. And the 100 and above category, I'm picking Neto Escobedo. Okay. All right. 
I have kind of cheated in that for each one I had two options. And I'll tell you who they both are. Two of them have been negated because you picked them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the 1 to 50 range, you picked Taylor Swift. I That was one option. I also am thinking that this is the year for Francis Tiafo. 51 to 100. I'm going to go again, double down on Brandon Nakashima. I picked him mm-hmm. last year. And in the 100 plus range, I am going to go with a cheat and say that Andy Murray is going to have a really good year, given good health and strength, and that him have a good okra body. <laughs> <laughs> On the women's side, players ranked 1 to 50. I'm giving you two here. Again, I'm cheating again. Mm-hmm. You're going first this time? I'm going first. I'm going to go with Rebakina. She's ranked 12, and maybe she's too high to really like experience a breakout breakout. But I, from what I've seen so far this year... The demolition of Emma Raducanu was just breathtaking. Mm. And I'm also going to double down on Clara Towson. Mm. Okay, okay. Ranked 51 to 100, I'm going to go with Amanda Nisimova. And 100 plus, I'm going to go with Haley Baptiste. All right. We have uh, another one in common. For my top 50, I picked two again. One of them was Rybakina. And I know that she's ranked in the top 15 right now. It wouldn't be really a breakout. But I think she could reach a Grand Slam final. To be clear, we did not look at each other's picks no. before we did this. My other pick for top 50 was Golubich. Mm-hmm. Uh, 51 to 100, Ruse. And over 100, I'm picking Zhang Chenwen. Okay. So we'll check in at the end of the year. We'll start with the WTA draw. I'm going to go ahead and blame you squarely for what has happened with this draw in the very first quarter. Because... All you could talk about the first couple weeks of the year was, man, I really just want an Ash Barty, Naomi Osaka, Australian Open final. That's all I wanted. That's all you wanted. I wanted to watch the two best players in the world, the two best hardcore players in the world. Two best friends in a room. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to see what they could do at the Australian Open, considering Naomi is coming off a long layoff, Barty is cemented as the number one player. It would be a great story. And I want to see this match. Alas, it may happen in the round of 16. Mm -hmm. For that to even happen, Barty would probably have to go through Georgie. And Osaka might... (laughs) I mean, who even knows here? Osaka would have to beat Yastrems... Well, first of all, Camila Osorio in the first round. Then maybe Yastremska in the second. And should Bencic get past Anisimova in the second round... It would be Bencic Osaka in the third round. And Bencic, to date, has Naomi's number, winning their last three matches, 3-1 overall. Mm -hmm. In this little section, we've got the number one player. We've got Georgie, who won Canada last year. Bencic, the Olympic gold medalist, one of the top hardcore players. Anisimova won a title last week. And Naomi Osaka. It's tough. That's the bottom line. That first little section is tough. Then, the other part of that first quarter, there is Angebur slated to play Maria Sakari in the round of 16. To get there, Jabur might have to play Pegula in the third round, and Sakari Kudermetova. I mean, other floaters there, Sasnovich is there, a finalist already this year. Mm-hmm. That's a, a first round to watch, is Jung versus Sasnovich, players who have played well in these first few weeks. That sets up a pretty challenging second round for Sakari, I think. Mm-hmm. Kuda Mertova was runner-up to Halep in, what was it, Melbourne, Somerset. She could play Sakari in the round of 32. Also, Ons is you know, heading into the tournament with an injury that she picked up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, a big question mark there as well. So, do we see Pagula as a quarterfinalist? Again. It's possible. And then, we head to the second quarter... That's headlined by Barbara Krejcikova and Paula Bedosa. By the time you listen to this, Bedosa may be a titleist. Or Krejcikova could be a titleist. <laughs> right. They're playing each other. Krejcikova, had she gone out meekly to Contivate yesterday after taking that bagel, this would be a very different conversation. But she is feeling it after being able to get out that match. Also in this uh, quarter, there is Victoria Azarenka. Svitolina, 
Madison Keys, current finalist Coco Goff. Paula Badosa has a tough, tough first round match against Isla Tomljanovic. Yep. There, you know, Marta Kostiuk is a dangerous floater down there. A popular pick for breakout player for a lot of folks this year, Marta Kostiuk. Let's take a look uh, elsewhere in the section. Donna Vekic and Allison Risk as a first round. Risk, who is uh, going to play Madison today for a title. Sonia Kennan versus Madison Keys first round. Mm-hmm. The way Madison is playing, I think she will probably win this. I never want to say she will win this easily because that is not always Madison's want. But based on form alone, Madison should get through this match. Potentially. Madison Keys and Coco Goff in the third round. Victoria Azarenka against Fedelina in the third round. And Krejcikova against Ostapenko in the third round. So to seed, the quarterfinalists here should be Krejcikova and Badosa. But uh, someone like Coco Goff could make a huge breakthrough at the Grand Slam level here. Azarenka, former champion. Svitolina, a perennial top 5 to 10 player. In the bottom half of the draw... The third quarter is headlined by Annette Contevate, who after blazing through the second half of last season, the fall season specifically, she's back, back, back again, still in form. However, she's got a tricky second round match potentially against Clara Towson. And who knows, maybe Krejcikova's doubles partner is going to have her singles break out this year. Siniakova, who plays Contevate in the first round. The dangerous, dangerous Shelby Rogers is on the other side of that small section who could play Daniel Collins in the second round. Uh, so it remains to be seen who could be the third round opponent there. Mm-hmm. But uh, don't look past Anaconya. Yeah, it really is a tough little section for Contivate, isn't it? By seed, you have Collins against Contivate in the third round. You have Mertens against Rybakina in the third round. You have Halep against either Sloan or or Raducanu, and then Zidanecek against Muguruza. Those are the third round projected paths there. Mm -hmm. Very optimistic that those will actually happen because your breakout pick, Golubic, she plays Rybakina possibly in the second round, and Sloan plays Emma Raducanu in the first round. (laughs) Sloan just got married. She just arrived in Australia. I actually wasn't sure if she was planning on playing in Australia because the wedding was so recently. The pictures were such a welcome respite from all the noxious drama we've been dealing with. She looked stunning in those photos. Which is to be expected. She's a stunningly beautiful woman. Sure, but the styling and the dress and Mm. everything, it was first rate. Not not a foot stepped wrong with those wedding stylings. And she gets it from her mama. Obviously. Sloane's mom ate in those photos. She almost drew focus. <laughs> anyway, in this quarter, you see a collection of players who have been playing well in these first few weeks uh, and players who have historically played well in Australia. Halep, a former runner-up in Melbourne. Mertens, she won a lead-up title uh, last year in Australia. Contivate, of course. Rybakina, a runner-up to Ash Barty last week. I would say you have four legit title threats in this quarter. You've got Contivate, who is slated to play Rybakina in the fourth round, Halep against Muguruza in the fourth round. Those four women, if you were to pick any of them to win the title, it would not be far-fetched. Yeah, yeah. Muguruza did not have a great showing against Kazatkina in the quarterfinals of Sydney, mm-hmm. but... Uh, she finished the year with a flourish last year. She is a hard court queen. She's a multi-surface queen. She can do it all. <laughs> Should she <laughs> be in the right frame of mind that day? In the final quarter, that's where we have Iga Sviantek and we have Arena Sabalenka, Petra Kvitova, and Angelique Kerber. Iga Sviantek looked fearsome in Adelaide until she didn't, right? She beat Fernandez pretty easily. And she also won a hardcore title here in Australia last year, but it was held after the Australian Open. She could play someone she beat last week, Daria Saville, formerly known as Daria Gavrilova. And then the other Daria, Daria Kazakina, is waiting for her in the third round there. Kazakina has really put things together. 
She beat Muguruza, as you said, last week. Like Amy Grant said, she turned the Titanic back around. Oh, we're, we're doing this we're again. We're doing that again, yeah. <laughs> Lower down in that section, Patrick Vidova, Serana Kirstea, Sam Stozer is a wild card for her final Australian Open. Kvitova and Pavlyuchenkova were are slated to meet in the round of uh, in the third round here, and the winner of that would play Shiontek, if we're going by seed or Kazakina. Sure, Petra though opens against Kirstea. Tough match there. We know that Petra struggles increasingly in long three set matches. She struggles in the heat and the humidity. That's something to keep an eye on. I say that, and I let you sit there and drone on about what could happen by seed, whatever. For me, the takeaway here is Drone? That... Drone on? Yes. Drone on. Oh, okay. Is that what you think I, I do? I said what I said. <laughs> well, what you said was some bullshit. Possibly. <laughs> and should it turn out to be the case, I'll own it. <laughs> but I have here bolded for both little sections of this bottom quarter. It could be anybody. This is the wide open it, section of the draw. It really It could. is especially futile to try and make any projections from this section because it is the one where you could have a shock semifinalist. Mm -hmm. Angeli Kerber is the 16 seed here and opens against Kanepi. Kerber recently recovered from COVID-19 and did not have the preparation that she had hoped. And she said, basically, uh, set your expectations low because uh, I'm... I'm here to play, but I'm not exactly where I want to be at this stage of the season. Opening against Kaya Kanepi, uh, not not good, not great. <laughs> Arena Sabalenka is here. Who knows what to expect from her? She opens against Storm Sanders, could face Samsonova in the third round. This is a cute little section here. Mm -hmm. Or Anne Lee, frankly. Mm -hmm. Samsonova opens against Anne Lee. Samsonova would play Vondrosova in the second round, and Sabalenka would play Anne Lee, potentially, in the second round. You could make a case that either Samsonova or Anne Lee could be the one to make it all the way to the semifinals here. And remember, last year, Sabalenka came into Australia as the in-form player. Mm -hmm. As somebody who was riding a win streak, had won titles to end the previous year, losing to Serena in Australia. In a match she should have won. Yeah. But this is uh, a Sabalenka now who is really struggling on the serve and struggling with confidence. Technically and emotionally struggling. It's not a great way to start the season. And folks were out here mocking her in the Twitter streets. And that was not a good look because this stuff, there's no guarantee this stuff goes away. We've seen it across all mm -hmm. sports. With top, top players. Top, right? top players, major champions. Ian Baker Finch developing the putting yips. Never the same again. It happens all the time. Sarah Irani is still catching serves in the wind. To this minute. Mm -hmm. We will not be making any projections as to who is going to win on either draw. So let's just move on to the men. Of course, the complication with the ongoing Novak legal drama is that we don't know if he will be slotted in in the number one spot. If he's not able to play this tournament, then his spot will be filled by Andre Rublev. If the change is made before the first schedule of play comes out, number five Rublev will take his spot. Mm -hmm. If it's after the schedule comes out, he'll be replaced by a lucky loser. Mm -hmm. that, that will be the luckiest of loser. Indeed, because he gets to play someone who's unseated. So Novak's presence here is is the shadow over the men's draw. With him out, I mean, he has won it nine times. Medvedev was the runner-up last year. Medvedev is the U.S. Open champion. He would be a, a very heavy favorite if Novak were out, but it leaves a lot to be desired. I'm just, you know, going through the men's draw today, I was just feeling like it's just not, it's not giving. It's not giving what needed to be gave. See, I, I, I'm dis not I disagree. I disagree. I think... The absence of a Novak would ignite the men's draw. Mm. It would give so many people the opportunity. And it possibly could be the type of scenario where you see somebody who has shown potential for years upon years upon years. And this is their moment. You could have a veteran having a breakthrough moment at this tournament. 
You could have one of the, the younger, younger ones doing something crazy. Anything could happen, I think. Or we could get the uh, the heirs apparent in the semifinals and a predictable conclusion. Sure. Mm-hmm. We had a suggestion from a listener to just do the woman's draw and then play Venus <laughs> for the men's side saying, I do not know what's going on in the ATP. I just do not have the bandwidth. And wishing them luck. Wishing them luck and call it a day. To the folks in in the first quarter of the men's draw, we are wishing you luck because you don't know what the hell is going on. None of us has any idea. Djokovic could be there to play Monfils in the round of 16, or Djokovic isn't there and Monfils isn't there either. You know, this reshuffle affects a lot of people. It's, a, it's just still crazy to me that a player won't know where he is in the draw until we hear about some outside-of-tennis legal hearing. Mm-hmm. A lot of this is predicated on the absence of Djokovic, potentially. But if he's not there, look at somebody like Carlos Alcaraz. Like, it's possible. Mm-hmm. Berrettini, who's lost to Djokovic at, what, the last three slams? If he's not there, this could be a moment for him. First round matches to watch in this quarter. There is Cam Nori against Sebastian Corda. Corda, who just had to do his own isolation himself, posted videos from his hotel room that may be a complication for him you have Carnton Mutet against Luca Pui a blast from the past Luca Pui with a wild card and then Matteo opens against Brandon Nakashima those are the first round matches that we think are worth looking at here to me Corda is a dark horse to watch in this quarter Cam Nori has obviously proven that he can play on hard courts but Corda is somebody up and coming who could sneak through by seed. If Djokovic were to be there, it would be Djokovic against Bertini in the quarterfinals. And we have seen how that's gone. But again, we can't say anything further because we just do not know what will happen. In the second quarter, that's where that guy headlines as a number three seed, as well as Rafael Nadal. Nadal won to start the year, and he's now faced with a murderer's role in his path. As yes. far as I'm concerned, Indeed. like this is this is a lot. Yeah, let's start at the bottom of the second quarter. Nadal could face Kokinakis in the second round. But then his first round, don't get past that. Right, Marcos Giron. Karen Hachanov, who was the runner-up to Guillermo Fies in Adelaide, could be lurking in the third round. He's a medalist of the most recent Olympics. Fourth round, either Urkac or Karatsev. And then that guy may be in the quarterfinals before in the semifinals, if he's still in the draw, Djokovic. Karatsev has semifinal points here to defend, but he looks to be in great form. Orkac is the reigning Miami champion. There, there's a lot of heavy competition even before Nadal reaches uh, the quarterfinals. And even if that guy doesn't make the quarterfinals, there is also Denis Shapovalov, who would be that guy's fourth-round opponent. Yeah. So, okay, so AZ, that guy, he's the number three seed. He is the reigning Olympic champion, won the ATB finals. Actually, the number three seed on the women's side won their finals as well, WTA finals, Garbini and Muguruza. We don't want to talk about it, but he's in a great position to do well at this tournament. A, a very good position to potentially score his first top 10 win. At a Grand Slam, which is not easy to get, apparently. Not everybody has those. not everybody has that. In the bottom half of the draw, the first section is headlined by the number 8 and 11 seeds, Kaspar Ruud and Yannick Sinner. I mean, this is the result of very good years for both of them last year. And it's the first time that we're really seeing them in this position together. You know, it kind of stood out to me like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. These are the headliners here. But it it makes sense. When you mentioned that if Djokovic leaves the draw, it could open it up for a much younger person to have the tournament of their career. Sinner is the one I think about. Oh. You know, a Sinner could reach the semifinals here. Sinner could also wilt under the heat. Mm-hmm. Literally and figuratively. First round matches to watch. Uh, Andy Murray has to open against that other guy that we do not like <laughs> to mention by name. I said not for again. For the same reason. Not another one. Nicolas Basilashvili, Andy Murray won their match at Wimbledon. 
he also recently won in Sydney. So they're matching up well at the moment. So let's dwell on that. Mm -hmm. See, but though Andy has these moments where he lets leads slip as well. Mm -hmm. I believe he was up 5-2 against Bezlejvili in that match you mentioned. And ended up losing that first set before winning in three. When you're playing best of five, you cannot mm. ask Kane Ishikori. You cannot be having unnecessary, long, drawn-out five-set matches. Not on a metal hip. Right. Alex Diminar opens against Lorenzo Muzzetti. And uh, on paper, by name, this is one to watch. But Lorenzo has not won anything at all in a very long time. And so Rude Sinner in the fourth round, potentially. But if Andy gets through that first match against that other guy, he gets Terra Daniel or Barrios Lera in the second round, and then maybe Sinner in the third round. Mm -hmm. The next section down, RBA Bautista Rude, he opens against Travaglia. And then that's where Francis Tiafo is. Taylor Swift opens against Martyrer. And he would, <laughs> he would maybe get Francis Tiafo in the second round. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So when I say Fritz was my breakout pick, that doesn't mean I want him to beat Francis here. Mm. He doesn't have to break out at this tournament. Because you could. It's just at some point in the year. Francis was right there. You could have picked Francis, but you didn't. <laughs> so I thought it would. You know. Let's not be walking things. Back I thought it here. would reek of favoritism. Mm. I wanted to think outside the box a little bit. Do like Isa, okay. Root for everybody black. <laughs> <laughs> Grigor Dimitrov, the 26th seed, is seeded to play Stefanos Tsitsipas in the third round. So by seed, again, it would be what? Bautista Gut against Tsitsipas in the round of 16? But I do not expect that to happen at all. At all. Fourth quarter here. Andrei Rublev is the number five seed there at the top, but he could move. So I don't really want to go into this too deeply. So we shan't. Moving on. <laughs> what? <laughs> Marin Cilic is there. Oh, potentially Rublev Cilic, but again, it's just Cilic against question mark, question mark. We don't know. Dan Evans is there. Unfortunately, this is a type of situation where somebody like Dan Evans could just tighten his villain hat and just ride that wave of uncertainty in this section to a really deep run. Right. He would become a supreme villain if he beat Felix Ojeleisim in the third round. We've got Diego Schwartzman possibly playing Isner or Cressy in the third round. Please, I beg of Maxim Cressy, beat John Isner, because if I have to deal with another Schwartzman isner situation where people are like, oh my god, one so short and one so tall, like, look at the gap and the difference. <laughs> If I have to live through that one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, Cressy did beat a fellow giant, Opelka, last week. So there is that's a good sign. If Rublev stays in this quarter, it's almost like faded that he will play Daniil and lose. This is kind of the move, right? Yeah, he would have to get through Felix. You mm -hmm. just talked about how Felix did the thing at the ATP Cup. How amazing it was. This is his time to shine, 2022. He's a big boy now. All right. Nick Kyrgios is still in the draw. I thought Nick had COVID. He did. He does. Like, did or does? Like, he it did. It wasn't that long ago. I know. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I'm not his doctor. Uh, yeah. I'll admit that I have no idea what the isolation protocol is these days. Like, I don't know how many days it is. So Nick is in the draw now. To, to I don't... play Liam Brody, who is fashioning one of the kits of the year so far. Gorgeous kit, which he took off on court. Yeah, he took off the all the way to was his not, underwear. The umpire was not pleased about it. No. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -mm. But we do have to ration bathroom breaks these days, as you mentioned earlier. So that's a potential solution. One I would not be terribly mad about on the men's side. <laughs> Don't at me. <laughs> that's objectifying. Yeah, yeah. So Nick opens against Brody, and the winner of that plays Medvedev. Nick Medvedev? At night, in Melbourne, could be drama. Mm -hmm. Don't need it, but I would watch it. And then there's Ugo Umber. He might just have uh, a wonderful little recital before his match, get himself in the spirit to, to play the part on court afterward. He plays piano. 
Oh, wow. I, I was really not along for the ride on that one. <laughs> so yeah, men's, men's draw, I'm done. Like, I, I don't know. I don't have any idea. We are preoccupied by other things that have a direct effect on what this draw will look like. I'm sorry to you all that we are not able to give you much more. Mm -hmm. But if you were asking for a favorite, it's absolutely Medvedev. Maybe even if Djokovic plays, because given what he's been through... Yeah, at this point, uh, Djokovic is back in detention a few days before the tournament. There are obviously there are different schools of thought here, whether he is so defiant and singularly competitive that he is angry and rolls through the draw, or that it seriously messes up his routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so which is why I say that yeah. I think Medvedev is the favorite at this point. Oh, I wasn't even prepared to go that far to draw a conclusion of those like two polls. Uh, let's just wait and see who is actually playing come Monday and Tuesday. All right. Lots more to happen. Uh, typically, our next episode would be a mid-Australian Open episode. Who knows what mess will happen before then? It may require us to come no, back. Mm -mm. It no. may. No emergencies, nothing. I didn't say it was an we'll emergency. See, we'll see you in a week. I didn't say it was an emergency. <laughs> I said, we reserve the right. Listen, we weren't going to do any of that stuff. But then at the French Open, we had to come and do that Naomi episode, remember? We did, but I am tired. Well, And I'm busy at work, so uh, you're going to get what you're going to get. If need be, you will find the strength. <laughs> and like Whitney said. I look to you. I didn't know my own strength. Almost there. Same <laughs> album. Wrong song. <laughs> On that note, thanks again to everybody who's contributed to our GoFundMe. It's been uh, an incredible response. We are blown away. We have started sending out batches, big batches, big mm -hmm. Kornacki batches. <laughs> Bucks County, PA. A few swag, swag bags have gone out in the mail. If, if you've donated 150 or more, you're eligible for... Not eligible, you will get uh, a package with... Uh, a button with a couple of stickers, pen, notepad. Some of them you don't have, have to ruin the surprise. Okay, of a bunch it. of stuff. A bunch of stuff. Today, they were sent to three different countries. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we've sent out about thirty postcards with bookmarks already. Mm -hmm. So, for the bookmarks and the postcards, if you've donated fifty or more, please send us your address via Twitter, Twitter, via Twitter <laughs> DM. At the body serve, Instagram, wherever, email us thebodyserve at gmail.com. If this is all confusing for you, go to linktree.com slash the body serve where you have all our information, including where to donate if you'd like to still do so. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm James at Elliot JMR on Twitter. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan at tennis underscore John. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.